It's definitely like the Justin Timberlake of One Direction. So, yay! <laughs> All right, Tech is back. <laughs> Who are we talking about? <laughs> oh, I, I also saw One Direction live. <laughs> I was that girl. I saw them, I think, like twice. And then their opener, Five Seconds of Summer, I saw them both when they opened and then when they were solo. So, yeah, I'm that I was like deep in the Tumblr culture, but we don't have to talk about that because it's interesting. <laughs> uh, oh, okay. I think that was a good time in all of our lives, honestly. <laughs> yeah, it was a weird time. 2012 was a weird time. It was. Okay. Oh. I think all we're, right. we probably yeah. started. I think Sorry you had that little uh It's okay. I know. It's like you do all the prep you can and your webinar <laughs> <laughs> your webcam's like no ma'am. All right. Ah. All right guys, we're gonna start. I'm gonna turn this Just get I'm happy everybody's getting comfortable in the chat. Awesome, awesome. I'll switch my headphones. Okay. All right guys. Here we go. All right, so thank you guys so much for coming to our best practices for blog SEO webinar. Really excited to have you. We're lucky to have Sabina, our content strategist here. Thanks for having me, even though of course. this is a <laughs> coercion. Just kidding, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun, it's fun. Yeah, so I added both of our LinkedIn uh, links and usernames, so feel free to add us. Mm -hmm. And then so Sabina's been here for three years, right, Sabina? Almost three years. Three years in yeah. August, technically December, but I was a temp in August, so I'm <laughs> calling it my three years. Yeah, officially three years. Mm -hmm. And then Story is brand new to the company. We're very, very lucky to have her. She's our first our southern east coast technic i don't know where you technically would call south carolina yeah, yeah. but before <laughs> we all we were all west coast so now now we got someone yeah. on the other side so that's fun we're trying out the different time zone work situation it's been pretty smooth mm -hmm. i like it and get my day started pretty early comparative <laughs> comparatively comparatively <laughs> it's interesting Perfect. And yeah, yeah, and we are from Beacons Point. We are a video first content marketing agency. We're a HubSpot partner agency uh, and we create long form and video content for B2B um, technical companies, typically SaaS, but we have some manufacturing, some schools, some a little bit of everything. So that's us. All right, and so we do have a couple of questions for you guys, and I'll drop this poll here in the chat. So feel free just to answer whenever you get a sec. So we're just curious on a scale of one to five, one being the lowest, five being the highest, what's your experience with SEO? Just what you're used to and like what you've been doing. I would say personally, mine's like a three. <laughs> Sabina's taught me so much, I <laughs> think it's ridiculous. It's a never ending education journey for SEO. It genuinely it feels like it doesn't end. <laughs> just change. It changes all day, every day. So like when someone's like, I'm an SEO expert, I'm like, are you? Because pretty sure it's different today You're than it was yesterday. Five hours ago. <laughs> yeah, it changes, so. Yeah, it always does. All right, yeah, we have a wide range here. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Everybody's, yeah, middle ground, like around like 47% at three. That's good. Nice. So do you guys have any SEO struggles? Like what are your biggest SEO struggles? You can drop that in the chat. Mm -hmm. And then at the end, if we haven't answered your questions during the slide, we can give the questions to Sabina and we can touch on them afterwards. Yeah, so if you have any things that you struggle with with SEO or just questions right off the bat that we can answer um, later. Yeah. I'll mark them as a question and we can get back to them at the end. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Getting content to rank. Yeah, and Keywords as we're target. going, just okay. feel free to throw them in there and we can <clears throat> get to them all. Okay. And then this all is right. also just good for us to know what you guys are it working is. with. Exactly, and see like how we can help. 
And of course, we had to throw in a Schitt's Creek meme in there. <laughs> We're huge Schitt's Creek fans. So if you feel like David, <laughs> don't worry. Any other fans of Schitt's Creek out there? He's great. <laughs> Uh, all right, so we broke our agenda down into two different sections today. We're going to be talking about the best, best practices for writing a blog and then also the best practices for publishing a blog. Mm -hmm. So that involves keywords, readability, headers, URLs, meta descriptions. We're going to touch on it all in these two separate sections. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like we said before, stick around at the end so that we can get your questions answered. And I found this quote and I feel like it was pretty relevant considering how important this is, but no matter how niche or mainstream your market is, great content remains a significant focus for SEO. Would you agree with that, Sabina? Yeah. I mean, that's Absolutely. the only way to do SEO really is to have content. Otherwise, yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't <laughs> know what, what else you'd be doing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, so what is, search engine optimization? Like that's the big question. Like everybody has a bunch of definitions and I think like SEO to us is the process of utilizing specific tactics to optimize the probability of your website's rankings on search engines. And so by doing so, you're improving your site's website ranking on search results and then also increasing the number of visitors on your website. Like that's what you want. You want people to organically come to your website. You want them to convert. So <laughs> that's what we're gonna be talking about today. And so why is it so important? Blog optimization has the ability to generate more organic traffic, rank higher in search results, and then also creates better user experience for people coming to your page. And I think, are we ready to pass it along, Sabina? Yeah. <laughs> you want the torch? All right, yeah. awesome. So let's jump into best practices for writing a blog. Yeah, so we, like she said, broke this up into two different pieces. And if you're kind of, in the five of SEO, like you really experienced, you've been doing it a lot. There's probably a lot of stuff you already know in this, um, but maybe you'll learn something new. So just to start, we're going to talk about the best practices for writing the blog before we publish. So um, number one, obviously you want to use relevant keywords. And so just to go through some definitions, uh, what is a keyword? Keywords are ideas and topics that define what your content is about. And then uh, long tail keywords are the more specific phrases that people are likely to use in search when they're like closer to making a purchase or if they're using like voice to um, voice to text, uh, they're more likely like questions. So they're very specific um, and often easier to rank for than general keywords. And then next. So with keywords, um, you should be focusing on like the user intent and the helpful content because obviously Google's number one goal is to give searchers content that satisfy their search intent or their questions. So if you are creating content that answers like real questions that people are looking for and offers solutions, um, this will help searchers with their pain points. And then the longer they're on your page, the longer they consume your content. This is a signal to Google that your content answers their question. And so that is a ranking boost. Um, so a big part of that is knowing what your audience is asking, knowing their pain points, and then knowing how you fit in with the solution. So I think the biggest part of SEO other than content is knowing your persona. Um, so that's huge. And then obviously you wanna place keywords where they make logical, logical and contextual sense. Um, and I saw a comment in there about, um, I saw a comment in there about keyword stuffing and how mm -hmm. competition is still killing it with keyword stuffing. I'm not so sure like how they're going about the keyword or how they're going about creating their content. But in my mind, I think you have way more validity and authenticity if you don't do that and you are really truly trying to answer a question. Um, because then like, say your competition writes a blog and they use the keyword, like every other sentence, it's going to look spammy. It's going to look really hard to read. So people aren't going to get a lot of value out of it, in my opinion. Um, and so I think in the end, they're probably hurting themselves. Like maybe they rank like three on the page, but there's plenty of content I've read that rank first page. And I'm like, this is not, this is not that good. This isn't that helpful. So I think it's just, 
a matter of doing what they're doing, except way better and offering fresh insight. So, uh, and then moving on to number two, you know, placing those keywords strategically throughout their throughout your content and like the keyword variation. So like mixing up the way you're talking about the same thing. Um, so, you know, like putting your keywords in your title, your H1, your subheadings, link anchors, URL, alt text, um, meta descriptions, and in places in the body that make contextual sense. Because um, like poor keyword usage can hurt your rankings. Um, strategic placement helps with SEO and indexing, and then it gives people insight into whether or not your content is what they're looking for. So, and then number three, Again, you want to write for readability because yes, we are keeping in mind Google and the little spiders that crawl your website, but at the end of the day, you're writing for people really and truly because people are going to be the ones that are your paying customers. So you want to make sure that they can understand and ingest and comprehend what you're, excuse me, sorry, what you're trying to tell them. Um, so part of this is, you know, using active versus passive voice. Um, using correct grammar and spelling and, you know, utilizing the tools that are on the internet um, because I don't know about you, it's been a hot second since I, since I took an English class and, you know, grammar and spelling, it gets away from you once you get into like the real world. So use things like Grammarly or spell check, you know, use the tools that are there for you because it really does help. Um, and then you want to be succinct, but thorough. So, you know, talk about a topic um, as much as, or as thoroughly as you can without getting like preachy or super theoretical and like covering things that people don't necessarily care about. Um, and part of that is like keeping your paragraphs super short and your sentences short, but getting the, the gold nuggets within the content that you are writing. Otherwise, you know, it's gonna be like a wall of text and people are not gonna wanna engage with that. Short attention spans. Thanks technology. <laughs> <laughs> And then moving on, you know, you keep blog title 60 characters or less. Again, maybe this is like commonsensical, but uh, if your title is, if your title tag, which is different than your H1, which we'll talk about, if your title tag is longer than 60 characters, you run the risk of it being cut off in the SERP. So you could have this brilliant title, but if it's more than 60 characters, people aren't going to see the rest of it. So make sure you, you really, uh, get that as condensed as possible without losing like the gist of what you're talking about. And another line for that is like making sure that your headers or your title tag and your headline match the content that you wrote about because search intent and like what you've actually written need to match up. Because if you title your blog like um, five reasons dogs are better than cats, and then you talk about like, what is a dog? What is a cat? How do you take care of a dog? How do you take care of a cat? And then you get to the list. People are like, this isn't what I wanted. Like, I want, give me the numbers. Like, I want the listicle now. So you have to make sure that whatever you're titling your content matches what you're writing. Um, so that was a bit of a side note, but <laughs> moving on to number five, which I guess does relate is using headings appropriately. So just to define what each of these are. A title tag is the headline that shows up in the search results um, that Google sees and people in the SERP see. So this is intended to like really delineate what you're talking about into a succinct sentence so people and Google know what, they, what to expect when they jump to your blog, which again, needs to match what you're talking about. Otherwise, people will bounce, people are not gonna be interested, and then Google's gonna like, take that into consideration, like, oh, people weren't staying on the page. Um, like, this is probably not matching what they're looking for, which bounce rate, I don't believe is like a technical ranking factor anymore, but it does play into um, the actual ranking. So then H1 headers, they're different than your title tag. Um, they don't usually show up in the search engine results, um, but it appears on your web page when people land. So it can be the same as your title tag, or it can be different, it's totally up to you, but as long as it matches the general theme um, and you should only be using one H1. And then subheadings. Subheadings are the sections that you use to structure your content in a way that makes it like scannable and easy to digest for the people that are reading. So your H2s and your H6s should um, be really structurally different and cover different things and have a logical flow to the content so like, you know, if you have to define what you're talking about, 
and then go into the details, like making sure that your headers are relevant and use keywords when appropriate and follow like a logical flow of information. Next, uh, why should you use headers? Obviously the title tag helps your click through rate. You know, if it's something that's interesting and relevant and people are looking for, it'll help your click through rate. Um, it helps your relevance in search and then your internal headers, once you get into your blog, they help with scannability and then your ranking. Moving on. Um, there we go. So using internal and external links, just some quick definitions. Internal links are any link from one page on your website that goes to another page on your website. So like a blog to a blog, a blog to a product page, product page to homepage, whatever it is. Um, and then external links are any links that go from one domain to another. So this could be um, links that come to your blog or your website from another website or websites that you link to in your own content. And then anchor text is that um, it's just the little the little highlighted blue underlined text that um, has the link that people click on to. And so that should be succinct and relevant to the page you're linking to. Um, and then with all of this, a deeper look at like your internal linking because or your internal linking structure and your strategy. Um, I'm sure a lot of people have heard of topic clusters. So like topic clusters are a really good way to set up an internal linking strategy from the get go. Um, Cause obviously you can add links as you go and go back and add some to old blogs when you make new blogs and all that good stuff. But um, you know, the topic cluster approach really helps you define what you're gonna talk about and establish connections in between all of those things. And that helps people stay on your site longer, helps people get like very thorough answers to their questions and explore deeper into the things that you have expertise about and things that they wanna learn. So that's linking. Oh, and just a note on external linking, making sure that same as like when you're in school and they're like, hey, you can't use Wikipedia as a source, same deal now. Like don't just link to things that have high authority because that will help with your own credibility. So avoid Wikipedia. That's, that's what I stick to, <laughs> so. <laughs> and then sen, seven, wow. Um, creating high quality and helpful content. So obviously this is like what we've been talking about with all of these different elements, but at the end of the day, useful and relevant content is what you should be aiming for you know um motivating your website visitors to stay longer learn more get to know you as a company um you know helping generate backlinks so if you're creating really good content then other people want to link to you um and then high click-through rate so like google considers this as an important factor to rank on your website so the more users you get to click on your links, the greater chances you are to get better rankings. So all of it is a very like cohesive ecosystem. And I fully believe that SEO, you can learn the basics and you can understand the principles, but it's really about trial and error. So you just have to keep testing things out and see what works and see what people are interested in. And you could find that a keyword that you thought had almost no search volume is like one of your biggest generators of quality traffic because it's what people are looking for and where they're at. So all of these things help you target desired keywords, enhance user experience, um, and then just build your authority in your space. Then moving on to number two. So this is after you've written your blog and now you're gonna publish it. Um, some best practices there. So first, you know, optimizing your URL. So your URL should describe the content on the page. Um, and then it should give searchers and search engines a clue about what they're gonna land on. So it should include keywords. Um, you should be separating words with hyphens. Um, you should be using lowercase letters. It should be short and then it should be static, which means it shouldn't change. Like if you come back to it in a few years and you wanna optimize your blog, you want to make sure that your URL can stay the same. So like, again, going back to like the five reasons dogs are better than cats. Um, <laughs> that's like the first example that came to mind. But going back to that example, uh, you don't want to put five in the URL. You should just say like reasons dogs are better than cats or like dogs better than cats. 
reasons and you want to leave out any years any numbers anything like that because if the body of your copy changes and say you like the next year you're like seven reasons why like you can't change your url and it's also not super helpful so leave numbers out of it keep it static make sure it can stay the course over the years and then why again optimize urls give people in search engines a quick way to understand what your page is about and then two, uh, writing accurate meta descriptions. So what is a meta description? Um, it is an HTML element that gives a brief summary of the web page. It usually shows up in the SERP under the title tag. Um, so it gives searchers an idea as to what kind of content is on your page. Again, all of these elements are really just like giving people an insight into what you're gonna talk about so that they can determine really quickly if they wanna click in and learn what you have to say. Um, and then this also shows up when you share blogs on social media. So you want to make sure that your description really captures what your blog is about. It's free advertising. And then three, using alt text for all photos. Alt text is the written copy that appears in place of an image on a web page if it doesn't load. And it's also the text that screen reading tools use to describe images to people who are visually impaired or have partial sight. So that's super helpful. Um, and a little more about alt text. It should describe the image and be super specific. Um, it should add content that's related to the topic. Uh, it should be 125 characters or less. And then not start with things like picture of a baseball player, image of a dog. Like it should be very specific. So like chocolate lab sits on park bench and watches birds play in the grass, you know, like something that tells a story so people who aren't looking at it can picture it in their mind um, and then use keywords sparingly if it makes sense in context so why do we do this it strengthens the message of your pages with the search engines it makes your content more accessible to differently abled readers um, it provides a user experience for people who may not have like the wi-fi or the bandwidth to load images um, and then it also your images can turn up in search results in the image pack or um, just in the image search results. So this can also drive organic traffic to your site. And that could be like, I think the biggest examples that I could think of were like infographics. So like if you have an infographic on your site, you wanna like make sure it's very um, specific to what the infographic is about. Because like by Google search, like infographic about dogs and cats, like then that will populate in a different section of the search results. And then moving on to uh, number four, correctly formatting headers. So your header should be formatted as HTML heading tags in your website's text editor, rather than just making like the text large and bold, because then it's easier for search engine bots to crawl and index web pages and understand the structure versus just like, if I made my H1, not an H1 in the content editor, but just made it 30 point font and bold like it's not it's not going to register as different so then moving to five making sure links open in new tabs this might be commonsensical but if you add an internal or an external link you want to make sure that it opens in a new window so that people don't lose the page on your site they were on especially if you're linking to an external site um, like, yes, if you link to an internal page, they're still on your website, but you've taken them away from what they were originally doing. And then if you link to an external site, but it doesn't open in a new tab and it just refreshes the page, like they might not come back. They might be gone forever. So you just want to make sure that you uh, have everything open in a new window. Otherwise, you might lose lose some people on the journey. And then six, using blog tags strategically. So blog tags are super helpful for your readers because it helps them um, find the content related to what they're looking for really easily. And it helps you to strategically create and group content um, at a high level. But you wanna be very careful because your blog tags should be very unique and not overlap, add overlap. Because when you typically when you create a blog tag, it creates a new page on your website um, so like blog tags aren't necessarily like crawlable for Google, but the pages that they create are. So if you have one blog that falls into four different tags and they're all very similar, then it comes up as duplicate content on your site and that's going to hurt you. So make them very high level, 
and unique and only give blogs like two to three tags at most. So those are blog tags and it makes, again, it makes your site easier to navigate and then it avoids like duplicate content on accident. Seven, posting consistently. So sites that publish blog articles on a consistent basis have on average 434% more index pages than sites that don't publish regularly. Um, Google likes this fresh and useful content. Uh, having more quality pages for search engines uh, to index signal, or sorry, <laughs> having more high quality pages for search engines to index signals that your site is credible and trustworthy and has thought leadership on the topic. Um, and then obviously this increases traffic and time on site for people. Oh, sorry. And then eight, optimizing your content consistently. So, you know, you've published a blog and that's awesome, but then it sits there for like six months, a year, and the traffic starts to plateau and decay and die down. And you're thinking, well, this used to have a ton of traffic. Like what, what happened? Um, Google looks at freshness when they're ranking pages. So what you want to do is you want to go back to those blogs and that content and refresh it consistently because it decreases the decay and then it helps you grow your total traffic with less effort than if you were to create a whole new blog post. Um, and there's a ton of resources out there about optimizing and refreshing content, but some basics are like you can change everything in that blog or you can change a couple paragraphs. It's just really up to you and like how the topics progressed, if you have new opinions on the subject, um, if you want to add a video, if you want to add some other content to it. So like you can do that in a million and one different ways, but this freshness is really, really important um, when it comes to ranking existing pages. And then number nine, you want to promote content to drive traffic. So obviously social media isn't an SEO ranking factor, but it sends social signals like likes, shares, and comments that come from people sharing your content on social channels, which helps build trust and customer loyalty, drive brand awareness and exposure. And then these indirectly help boost your online visibility and traffic. So it's not SEO related, but it does help with the visibility. And we always try to like promote content because it takes a while to get some organic um, <clears throat> organic traffic to blogs, like it takes a while. So in the, in, in the me, wow. In the meantime, it's important to get traffic to your content and start sending those social signals. That's this content that people care about. So now a gift from my favorite show of the last like two years, Ted Lasso. Does anybody have any questions? I know we have some already. Yeah. We have a few that I've been marking. I will go to the beginning and see. So Jenny asked a question. So writing about SEO so that others understand <laughs> what it is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but let's see. So we go to the question. So do you have any suggestions on how to increase the visibility when discussing a topic that's widely discussed and written on, like how to turn a topic that's mm -hmm. already been written about into something that's your own? Yeah, so with something that's like really high difficulty or has a ton of content out there, it's going to be way harder to rank because you're going to need backlinks, you're going to need um, a really high like site authority score and all that stuff that goes into ranking. So when it's a very popular topic, like for example, employee retain or retention and attraction. Uh, it's a huge topic right now with all of the turnover. Um, you want to find a long tail keyword that is related to your business. So for example, we have a client who has um, a lot of professional services that they give small companies. And part of that is HR human resources. So instead of just going after employee retention, it's like how employee handbooks help with employee retention because they help companies write employee handbooks. So it's finding a niche um, long tail keyword or a cluster of keywords that people are looking for, but they are maybe have like lower search volume, but the difficulty is also going to be way lower. So it's finding those subcategory topics that um, that you can write about and you have expertise about uh, versus trying to go after something that's got like 88% keyword difficulty and 
3,000, 4,000 monthly search volume. So it's finding like those niche, those niche keywords. So that was a question from Sarah. So Sarah, let us know if that helped. And then we also have one from Mara and she's like, yes, don't know how to exactly improve my SEO. So you touched on few those, there any like very like beginner skills, like how you get started in just boosting your SEO? I would say like, again, it's, it's such a wide concept and it really is a process of, from my experience, it's a process of trial and error. So I would say like, to start, go back to the drawing board and make sure that your targeted keywords are relevant to your business and um, relevant to the people that you're looking at. So making sure, um, and I love using SEMrush because it'll tell you like search intent usually, like if it's navigational, if it's people ready to make a purchase or if people are looking for a specific like site page. So making sure whatever keywords that you're targeting matches where that person's at in their user journey. So if they're looking for something that's strictly informational and you're creating content that's like, here's what we do and how we fix it and why we should be your um, your company of choice, why you should buy from us, um, then it's probably not going to be super helpful for them because they're still in the beginning of phases of like, well, how how do I get rid of algae in my pool? And they're like, pay us, we're a pool cleaning service, you know. So it needs to like match what your searchers are looking for and their understanding level at that point because you don't want to jump the gun and be like here's our stuff and they're just like i just i'm i don't know what i'm doing yet so you know it has to match so chris asks uh i believe you touched on this earlier but he asked google always says not the keyword stuff and that his competition absolutely still does this in 2022 and they're crushing it mm -hmm. so is that just a fluke or... Well, it's like with SEO, again, keywords aren't the only thing that it has to do with. It could have to do with like the backlinks that they're getting and the sites that are linking to them um, and their authority score. And so it has a ton of different factors. And I think you would be doing yourself a disservice to keyword stuff. Um, obviously, you want to look at your competitors and what they're ranking for and the keywords they're targeting. But if you want to target those same words, you want to be better than them you know you don't want to just regurgitate what they're doing um so it could have way more to do with like the other factors rather than just like the keywords so could a competitor analysis through sem rush help him with that to see like what his backlinks are and yeah that you can possible? see you can see like what um your competitor where your competitors are getting linked to um you can see all of that stuff in SEMrush. So I highly recommend it as a tool, but yeah. That's a great tool, yeah. yeah. You could spend days in that and not even scratch the surface. It's crazy. Nina Ray asks a similar question about like keywords that target certain ethnic backgrounds. And I feel like that's a tool, she could use SEMrush or another optimi optimization tool mm -hmm. to look up what other people are using and their score and see yeah. if she's able to rank for any of that. Yeah, exactly. You want to look at what your competitors are doing, what they're um, targeting. And again, it's like knowing your persona. So it's not so much like targeting the ethnic backgrounds as much as targeting what those what that demographic is like searching for. So rather than like going for like the the really service level basics, it's like answering questions that they're that they're asking. So it's more on like the personal level rather than the demographic level, if that makes sense. Absolutely. So getting to know and like doing your buyer persona interview is doing all mm -hmm. of that, like making sure you're doing the research beforehand. Yeah. Understanding who you're talking to and what they're struggling with, because I think yeah. a lot of companies and sometimes we're um, guilty of this with our own marketing is like, we think we know who we're targeting, but if you ask a couple of simple questions to somebody who fits your like uh, ideal user profile or customer profile, and you're like, hey, what are you challenged with on a daily basis? And they say, well, X, Y, and Z, like this is what I have trouble with. And it's like, well, shit, we were, we were looking at D, A, B, C. Like, you know, you have to be <laughs> on the same page with the people that you're trying to talk to. Yeah. And Ashley asks uh, about getting content to rank for keywords. Is there like a sweet spot when you're looking up keywords of where you want to aim for? I mean, it's again, it's a lot of trial and error and just understanding yeah. what your people are looking for, what 
unique perspective you can give to the topic. Um, and that's where like talking to your subject matter experts in your company really comes in handy is like, they are the people that understand um, what you guys do on like a very intimate level. And then you talk to your salespeople because they know what your customers do and need help with on an intimate level. And then making sure that marketing sales and like leadership are all in a really like sweet conjunction. So you know exactly what what keyword group that you should be targeting and looking at and creating content around. So it's like, it's kind of a three ring circus of things. It's not just looking at keywords. It's like finding the keywords that make sense and then writing content around um, those sweet spots and making sure it matches intent and pain points and all this stuff that we've been talking about. And Ashley had a question about on the alt text about what she said for inclusivity, is it best to, uh, or is it a better example of to say student rather than a girl or people instead of women? Like, which is better? Like if it is a woman sitting on a park bench, but she is obviously a student, like how is it better to explain somebody? Like how in depth do you need to go? I would be as specific as possible because you have to imagine like, if you don't have like the Wi-Fi to load an image, like, and you want to understand what that is, like, it makes way more contextual sense in my mind to say student because then you take, like, it might be a woman, but it takes like all of the contextual elements of like a student. She probably has a, um, backpack. <laughs> it's probably has a backpack. She's probably on a laptop. She's probably reading a book or something like as specific as you can get, um to like what is happening i think the better um yeah. i don't know so much about like ranking you know like woman versus student but i think student probably encapsulates the the vibe a little better you know than just like woman sitting on park bench with laptop it's like student studying on a park bench with her laptop and a book you know and you can use her to like denote you know gender you know so there's other ways around that other than just saying woman woman is doing this you know so sorry that was my caveman voice <laughs> <laughs> we liked it yeah, it was my julian solomita caveman voice <laughs> chris asks avoid one-off tags please explain that so you brought mm -hmm. up not like i guess tag stuffing <laughs> yeah so why should you use just one to two <clears throat> um so one-off tags first are like um tags that you will never use again you know to um describe another blog so they usually live at the top of your blog or depending on what hosting service like for ours they sit at the top and people can drop down and say oh i want to learn more about buyer personas and then they'll get linked to this page with just a catalog of everything we've tagged as buyer buyer personas and so you want to avoid like one-off tags like say we wrote a blog about buyer like questions to ask during your buyer persona interviews and we tagged it um questions to ask and then we never used it again like it's just a little page on your website that has really no like value um and then it gets really messy in those little clusters so people don't really know what to look at and what to choose so that's the one-off tags um and then you want to limit your tagging to like two to three because if you're writing a blog that covers more than like two topics that you typically write about, then it's probably trying to do too much. Yeah. So the golden question, how often should we be updating our content? It really depends on your industry and your search traffic and how quickly things change in your uh, niche. Um, some people say you should do it every two weeks other people say like it can be every couple of months i think it should match whatever your internal bandwidth is so if you are a really small marketing team um, you should be trying to balance fresh new content that you're writing and then um, content that you're optimizing and it just needs to match what helps your like your bandwidth and your cadence so um i would say definitely don't go longer than a year without touching something, but you don't have to go back a month later and be like, oh my God, I have to update this. So it really just depends on like how big your team is and how much time you have to do it. 
so we have a couple more that have rolled in from there. So mm -hmm. I think that one of them we're actually going to get to without we thought ahead on this one. But <laughs> so uh, do we have any tips for anyone using Squarespace? I know we have something coming up in the next slide that I wanted to show everybody. Mm -hmm. So do we want to wait to answer that? No, that's okay. I mean, I okay. have never used Squarespace. To be honest, yeah. um, all of our clients or most of our clients, about 90% are hosted on HubSpot um, because it's got a lot of like data opportunities and um, features that a lot of other hosting sites don't have. And then we have a couple people on WordPress. And for the hot second that I was helping people build out blogs on WordPress, it is not my favorite, but it is <laughs> doable and you can use it. Um, but I think HubSpot is definitely the best in terms of hosting. So I don't personally have any like Squarespace advice. I apologize. I use Squarespace personally, like for my own personal use, and I find it really easy to use. But I have same with you to be like I haven't messed around too much to get like mm -hmm. in depth with it. So we're gonna save that one and we're gonna do some research and get back to you, Betsy. <laughs> Thank you so much for asking that though. So all right, let's see, Mara. You said yes, I'm getting it. And if you're saying we can repost our blogs without updating, that is mm -hmm. fine if that is true. Or uh, we can repost our blogs with, yeah, you can, or instead of reposting them as a new blog, you want to edit it directly in the blog it already exists in rather than, because if you repost it, it's duplicate content and you're cannibalizing the keywords that you are going after. So you want to edit it within what it already exists as, and you can change the title, you can change the header, you can change the meta description. Like really the only thing you shouldn't touch is the URL because then if you've linked to it in other places, it will give people an error message if they try to go back. So like you want to edit it within there and then it will, Google will crawl it as like new fresh content. <clears throat> Ashley, thank you for tagging STM Rush. And so Liz, you, oh, wait, let's see. Chris, you said, what about blo Google Blogspot or host source? I have not, I don't know if I've, heard of any of those not not me outing myself um <laughs> wait, where is this question blogger oh there we go okay well, yeah sorry, it's at the very bottom so. it's the, one of the last ones that just popped up i have never used google blogspot um but yeah i guess it just depends on like what functionality they have and how much insight you can have into your data and understanding like where people are dropping off and what they're interested in um so it just depends on like how granular these sites allow you to be and how specific. So, yeah. And Sarah, like any specific SEO tips to use when posting or promoting podcasts? Yeah. So with podcasts, um, you can, what we do for a couple of people is we actually get those transcripts edited and then we post them on the blog as its own content, because obviously that's, um a lot of like really rich information that then lives as text on your website and then if people want to look at the transcript you can um link to that and then it gets people on your website listening to the podcast and skimming through um skimming through the content you know if you don't if they don't want to sit there and listen to like 48 minutes they can just command find look with find what they're looking for and then that's also a really 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 good way to repurpose content you know we probably do this every month for a client is we take something they've talked about in a podcast and we create an ebook or we create a series of blog posts you know it's like a really rich medium for creating content that then can get a ton of mileage you know so you're maximizing the effort that you're putting into those things so publishing i would say put it on your blog with like the embed code like the speaker details maybe like uh an outline of what you guys talk about with like timestamps, and then your full transcript yeah and then we use um otter ai but then we have um a really nice lady on upwork that we work with who goes through and like edits them for flow and gets rid of filler words and all that stuff so i think otter ai is a good option for just like ai generated transcripts but then you want you probably want someone to have that human touch to go in and edit it and you have a full capability of editing within otter ai it's a little painstaking but um if you're a one-man team and you don't want to outsource it it's easy to use 
yeah, of course, yeah, Otter, I, I've been using it first time, like total newbie, and it's super easy. <laughs> yeah. It's awesome. And what was the stat on how much content optimization matters versus blog content? All right, so. Um, I think the stat we had was about posting consistently, maybe like 434% more indexed pages. Yeah. Is that the, is that the one? We will be sharing the slides, this recording, mm -hmm. and a few special handouts as well within the emails that are going to be coming through to you after. So I just shared that for you, Jenny. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you, Chris. Yeah, that's really helpful. I want to look in the Google Blogger. You said it's not very user friendly as it should be. I yeah. find HubSpot to be <clears throat> user friendly, like, wouldn't you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's really easy to use and to understand and it's got a lot of like really good modules and stuff so i would say like again like analytics is huge um and using one that's got a lot of support so like if you do have an issue like obviously google is a huge company so i'm sure that their support is really good um but it's support customer service analytics and then user friendliness so if you're using something that just like feels like you're fighting an uphill battle then you might want to switch yeah, that's why I've already like contacted people before. They're super yeah, friendly they're and quick and it's, they're awesome. Yeah, of course, Mara, thank you. So we do want to share, does anybody have any other questions? And like we shared our info, so please don't hesitate to reach out to Sabina about questions. Mm -hmm. Me, I might relay them to Sabina. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, please do not hesitate to do that. So we wanted to share this and I feel like this answers some of the questions. Uh, Brian, our director of plat platform ops here at Beacon Point. What a guy. Yes, I was about to say, he comes with the facts. So oh, yeah. I'm excited. Brian is, <laughs> Brian is yeah. on lock all the time. If you, you want to learn really... something about anything, oh. you talk to Brian. You talk to Brian for like five minutes and you learn more than you've like ever known. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. Like, oh, I'm not really like an expert on this. And then he gives you the entire history <laughs> yeah. of the topic. He like, wrote the book on it. Okay. <laughs> So he's going to do a versus webinar, which is always really fun. And he's going to do which one's better, WordPress versus HubSpot. So you can always bring your questions about Squarespace to him, about Google. Like those are all great questions to ask him. And we can even reach out to him and see if he has any good like answers for us for that. So yeah, please make sure you guys register for that because it's <laughs> going to be a really good time. And he's super fun. I'll throw the link here. Mm -hmm. in to the chat but yeah let's see so we had a really good time do you guys have any other questions mm -hmm. they could be seo related content marketing related music related at this point like we've got like <laughs> we got four minutes until 11 so feel free to just you know go for it throw it in there <laughs> Thanks for coming, you guys. We appreciate. Yeah, we literally have so much fun. I know. Mm -hmm. This is our first time on Demio, and it's exciting. Any comments on having a YouTube channel? Yeah, we have. We're starting a YouTube channel, and maybe I'll let Story speak to this because she's <laughs> she's been in there making it happen. So, like, uh, YouTube is an entirely different search engine. You know, it it's has its own thing. ranking factors. It has its own, like, way of optimizing the content you're publishing. <laughs> so I think it's a really good avenue. If you have a lot of rich video content, it's a great way to get eyeballs on it. You just have to, like, learn the ins and outs, which I am personally not super familiar with, but it's a great channel. So I find that there's a method to the madness, and I like structure. So if you are allowed, I wish I had Thank you for asking a question, but you're allowed a lot of characters whenever you're in YouTube. So within the before the fold, I like to include a link. And then whenever you're doing the description in YouTube, just try and go as in depth as possible. And then also having time codes if your video is over two minutes. That is so helpful for searchers because those words also rank within the YouTube platform itself. So whenever you're adding that, like people can go through there just as a blog and pick up where they want to start. So along with that, like Make sure if you are able to transcribe the video, that also helps because again, it can be crawled and AI can see what your video, like what the heck it's even about. So there's a whole other thing to that and maybe we can throw some, I've built a few different uh, templates for YouTube descriptions <clears throat> and kind of like an outline. Maybe we can throw that in there in the follow-up emails with you guys. That's a great idea. Thank you so much for that. I forgot I did those. <laughs> they were pretty helpful. Yeah. 
And then um, is HubSpot a good platform to learn more about SEO? I would highly, highly, highly suggest looking at SEMrush because they have so many free courses on there um, for you to learn about their tools, but then SEO in general, uh, how to find keywords for your niche, how to find transactional keywords, how to, oh my God, they have everything under the sun. So I would really recommend digging into their resources because they they talk to experts in the field that are in it day in and day out. So they they know. Um, and then let's see. Yeah, we wanted to, there will be a recording of this. So you guys will be able to get that. And then also our deck. So just keep an eye out for that. What do you think about Medium for B2B marketing? Uh, Medium is the guest blogging media or site, correct? Do you know yeah. a story? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I think that, I mean, it's a great way to get eyeballs on content to a site that already has a lot of organic traffic. So I think if you can get like a guest post on Medium, as long as it's again, like optimized and helpful and uh, answers, answers like the search queries, like I think that's a great way to do it. And then it gives you a linking opportunity back to your site. So yeah, I don't see what I don't see what the problem would be there, but maybe like obviously you want to split your efforts between guest posting and then posting on your actual site because if you're an incredible guest poster and you have so much content existing places other than your website, yeah, it'll get you traffic, but then if you have nothing for them to read there, then it kind of is a moot point. So I would balance your efforts between those two. <clears throat> but yeah, guest posting is great. And there's a lot of like um, sites that do uh, like monthly roundups. So like data, data box does it a lot where you can get on a list um, where they'll send you a bunch of topics every month. And then if you have a comment or um, an opinion on one of the topics that they've brought up, then you can just submit it and um, they'll get you, they'll probably include you in um, that piece. Did you, can you go a little deeper into guest posting for us, Sabina? Maybe just a small little. Yeah, so guest posting is when you write a blog for a website other than your own. So um, it could be, we were working with, I don't remember what the site is, but like we had an agreement with a site where we would write them like five posts a year. And so that content would live on their website. Um, and then it would link back to our website. So guest posting is just another avenue for you to post content and expertise on a site other than your own. Um, so yeah, that's what guest posting is. And then, do you have an SEO blog checklist? Yes, we do. We have, uh, we can add links to websites like SEMrush, Otter, all those things, but we do have a checklist that we give our clients that has a bunch of this information. Yeah. So yes, and, you and guys then will we be can put that. that list together. Yeah, you guys will be getting that shortly. So keep an eye out for that. What are the ethical lines of a copy paste blog post with direct link? I do not like a copy paste because it feels inauthentic. And um, I mean, if it's something that you wrote originally and it just exists on another site and then you're putting it on your own. Um, I mean, you could do that. I think it's always a better option to do an offshoot or maybe like a continuation of that topic because I think duplicate content can hurt you in the end because it doesn't like Google may not know that like you originally wrote it on the other site and then just put it on yours with a direct link. Like they, it could just be like, oh, well this website took this and this blog has existed longer. So it's obvious that like this blog just copied it. So I would say don't do it. And like ethically, if you never, if you didn't write it and had no hand in writing it and just like copy paste it on your website. Ethically, I'm, I'm not about it. Um, Cause it's not, it's not your words. It's not your expertise. It's something that you thought was helpful and you can like use it as inspiration to write your own thing, but I wouldn't copy paste it. I feel like that's a good opportunity to have, like make connections. It was like mm -hmm. to reach out to somebody and see if they're able to speak on, like go to the expert, like get someone to speak with you about it so they can write about it kind of like an interview. Yeah. Like that's a great chance to like make friends, make connections. Yeah. And that's how we do it 
in our agency is we interview people and subject matter experts on their domain. And then we use those transcripts to write blogs. So it's a really like low impact way on their end to get expertise um, and make connections either in your company or outside of. Uh, best way to share a post from another publisher that you think is helpful. I would say on social or add links to your own content. You know, like if you're on LinkedIn a lot, you can be like, hey, I found this really helpful and give your like three thoughts about it or something to give people an idea what of what the content is. But then if you want to write a blog that is similar and makes sense to your niche and your business and you want to link to it, then that's great. You know, then you're giving them um, an external link that they didn't even have to like ask for. So I would say putting it in blogs as an, as an external link or sharing it on social. Um, and then if you have like a monthly newsletter, sometimes you can group it by topic. And if you found a really interesting blog that you didn't write about something that you find it, that you found helpful, then you can include it in your newsletter, like further reading, you know, like newsletters don't have to just be your content. It can just be like, helpful you know because at the end of the day people are going to trust you if you're helpful and if you're like hey i didn't write this but i thought it was super helpful here you go you know like it doesn't have to be about your company all day every day and i think linkedin is a great opportunity it's like an untapped market so many people post on there but there's not a lot of original content so if you're out there publishing what's worked for your company what's worked for you people are going to flock to you because they see you as a thought leader and mm -hmm. our alex He's Our away right now, but yeah, Alex <laughs> kills it on LinkedIn. He yeah. he kills it. He has so oh many great gosh. original thoughts yeah. and like discusses what's like what's worked for him and what's worked for Beacon's Point. And I just see it through that lens. But at the same time, like LinkedIn is a great spot. Like get mm -hmm. on there if you're not, and maybe use a little more if you aren't. And yeah. it's it's an amazing spot to be. Just post <laughs> what you know, and people will love it. <laughs> yeah. And speaking of Alex on LinkedIn, we live very close to each other. But I guess he was walking his dog a couple of months ago. And someone stopped me and was like, you're Alex from LinkedIn, right? Like, what? <laughs> yeah, I guess. That's so I weird. Like, I thought it was so funny. I guess. Like, we're I just didn't like, realize we were working with someone famous. Network. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. You could become yeah, I would uh, actually thank you. Add Alex. Oh, yeah. Let's boost him. Let's, Let's get him a little him. more famous. <laughs> Even though he's in Joshua Tree. And <laughs> abandoned us. <laughs> Does anybody else have any, you guys have like so many great questions. Like, thank you so much. Does anybody have anything extra that they would want to ask? Forget Alex from Target. It's all about Alex from LinkedIn. Pitfalls to avoid <laughs> exactly. biggest mistakes in terms of like SEO. Um, I would say avoid trying to do too much with one content piece. Um, and just honing in on a topic like obviously you want to be thorough and cover a lot of bases but you don't want to try to write a blog that's everything for everybody um so being like specific but thorough <clears throat> and then like i mentioned avoiding uh titling it something that doesn't match like the actual content itself so like if you have a blog that talks about best practices and how to's and all this stuff like a you might be trying to do too much or you can just title it something like you know uh I'm trying to think of an example like um curling hair for beginners you know or like guide to curling hair for beginners or guide to taking care of curly hair something 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 so like you want to make sure that your title matches the content um and then yeah avoid doing too much I'm trying to think of what else um avoid like super high keyword difficulty keywords because it's like it's not going to the juice is not going to be worth a squeeze so like make sure what you're targeting is worth your time and your effort because you know we're all busy so like if you are dedicating so much time to these keywords that you're going to get nothing from then you might want to pivot so yeah just make sure your effort is rewarded because y'all are busy people <laughs> and i've made a very amateur mistake before in my path, like with my own blog is changing the URL. <laughs> don't <Yeah>. do that. <laughs> don't change, there you go. Do yeah, don't change do the URL. Cause then it's a whole, it's a whole thing. Someone might have it bookmarked and they might mm -hmm. go back to it. And if they lose it, they don't care anymore. So yeah, <laughs> just don't do that. And you don't want broken <laughs> Obvious, links but on very your site. Very silly mistake. 
Awesome. Of course, Mara. Of course, Richard. Yeah, I'm happy to see you, Richard. I know we connected on LinkedIn not too long ago. That's great. Really sharing. So we'll be sharing everything with you guys, mm -hmm. like everything we've discussed, all of this. Mm -hmm. And we obviously will have like the recording of us answering questions, but um, in our follow up, yeah. we'll include all of the different resources that we've talked about SEMrush, HubSpot, Otter AI, yeah. Upwork. You know, if you want to look for some uh, vendor help you know, transcribers, editors, writers, you know, there, there's everybody under the sun over there. Yeah. Thank and you, Richard. I sign up for Brian's like yeah. webinar. We're really excited for that. We're going to be attending that. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, make sure you hop on that too. We'll include that link as well. So Brian if you guys- is the man. He is the man. <laughs> so if you guys, everybody, Questions and also answered. feel free to email us like if you have yes. follow-ups hit us up on linkedin email us uh if you email us or if you, at least if you email me i will respond with an email video signature that i forget is there and i cringe when i realize people have watched it but <laughs> if you want a little bit of a uh, embarrassment on my end then feel free to email me and if i respond you'll get to watch it <laughs> <laughs> Awesome, guys. Well, thank you so much. We had so much fun. This is our first Demia webinar, most, both of our first webinar together. So it was mm -hmm. a lot of fun. <laughs> thank you guys so much for showing up. Bye. <laughs> Bye, guys. <laughs>